to, to open us up to what are these things called spiritual disciplines. Now, how many of you actually have heard that word, spiritual disciplines? Raise your hand. Yeah, you know, I, I was a oldest student here. Um, well, I came in 19, I came to the Lord in 1974. Came, I went to a Bible, I came here in 1976. I was a Bible and theology major. Back then, I don't think we used that language. And this, um, in fact, I, I think, I've been part now of what we call a spiritual formation movement. People like Dallas Willard, friend, um, we, we we're interested in really bringing growth and formation into the church. But I think when I first heard that word, I don't think I liked it. I think back 17 years ago, 18 years ago, I went on a retreat. This was one of the first extended retreats I ever went on. It was three weeks. And during that time, the spirit took me into such deep places of my sin. He, he really just kind of cracked me open. And during that time, I, I, I experienced such issues of my sin that I, I used to read about when I was going to seminary. I went to Talbot here as well. Where I mean, in this little cabin, I, I was crying and weeping over what I had become. But during that time, I remember this, this was 1994. I, I came to experience the ministry of the Spirit that I had never known. During that time, I had actually, now I come from a very non-charismatic background and training. I, I came to the Lord, I went to a church in the San Fernando Valley. Uh, John MacArthur was the pastor. He's not exactly a charismatic uh, pastor. And so I didn't think in terms of the ministry of the Spirit and how He works in my life in various ways. I was. Uh, we were a people of the Word of God. Well, during that time, I began to have internal experiences of the Spirit, right in, in the depths of my depravity and sin. J just as you're sitting there external to my senses, I began to experience the presence of a lover loving me that I had never known. And by this time now, I've been teaching systematic theology here at Talbot, apologetics, and, and now systematic theology at Rosemead. And during that time, I had, even there were external experiences of the Spirit, it, it just kind of blew me away. And when I came back from that, that three-week retreat, I decided I wanted to spend the rest of my, my life understanding not just my systematic theology, but I really wanted to understand spiritual growth. How does this really work? Why was it when I came to the Lord in 1974, I had such an incredible time of experiences of love and God's closeness. I came to the Lord, my wife led me to the Lord right at the end of high school, then we, we got married right away. And, uh, and then there was this time of incredible dryness in my life. All the way through graduate school, and into teaching here, and then on that cabin in a three-week retreat, the Spirit opened my heart so deeply. So I really wanted to understand spiritual growth. One of the first books I began to read, it was Dallas Willard, and it was on the spirit of the disciplines. And I remember when I heard that word, disciplines, I, there was something in me that didn't like it. I, I was into love. I, I, I began to experience the love of God. The cross was getting so big in my life. I love the cross of Christ now because it provided daily experience of forgiveness for my sins and the ministry of the Spirit. And so when I heard the word discipline, it sounded kind of legalistic or, or harsh. In fact, it, you know what it reminded me of? It, um, how, how many of you ever seen the, the, cartoon, you know, the Disney cartoon Jungle Book? How many of you seen that? Do, do you remember in Jungle Book, you know, I watched this a million times with my daughters. Uh, remember Colonel Hardy or something like that? Remember this big elephant, you know, Mowgli's meeting these elephants, and then he meets Colonel Hardy, and, and Colonel Hardy's telling him what it used to be like, you know, oh, when I was a young boy, it was discipline. Remember that I was in the military, and I was in the pack of dorm, and oh, those were the days. Discipline, discipline. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, discipline. <laughs> but you know, I've come to see that uh, the Christian life, it is about love. But now as I have been at this a while, I have begun to see that it really is about a discipline of love. Because it's going to turn out that love isn't just going to easily flow out of you. See, the Christian life is about love, but it's not just gonna come out automatic. It's going to turn out we're going to need a training in love. We're going to need to be trained in how to love. We're going to be need to train in, in how to stay in love. 
I, I've been married now 36 years. And my wife and I have gone through all kinds of peaks and times where, where love feels a little low, where love feels high. Lately, you know, our daughters are 17. They're about to come to Biola next year. And uh, yeah, yeah. they have no choice. Uh, no, they have no choice. And Greta and I have just noticed, you know, where the love's been a little low. And so we have, we have we're, we're, we're back in training. We're back being careful to spend time together. It, it, this really is a training. So what I want to do is I, I want to pray, and then we're going to start with these notes. But let, let's pray first and open our heart. Father, we want to come to you, and we want to bring our heart to you. Lord, I, I just ask the students would collect the pieces of their heart wherever they are, and they would bring these to you right now. So I just want you to, as you're sitting there talking to the Lord, I want you just to tell the Lord right now, God, this is where my heart has really been. See, I don't want you, I, I don't want you to put aside pieces of your heart. I want you to collect pieces of your heart so they can be here. So I want you just to ask the Lord right now, God, where has my heart really been this week? What have I been worried about? What have my treasures been? What have I been thinking about? What have I been concerned about? I just want you to share for a moment, where is your heart really right now? So that you can just be true with him and be with him as we talk. Father, I pray that you would teach us during this time and open our heart to what it would be to really open to this training in love. So may you hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want you to take the hand now. And I want to start with the first thesis. Because the, the first thesis is like, uh, you know, we were just kind of praying beforehand. And uh, Christy was talking about just the pressure of what it is to be in school. So I have no idea the things that are going on in your life. But I, I remember being here at Biola and the last weeks of the semester kind of getting crazy. Some of you are staying up late. How many of you stayed up late last night? Yeah, so you mind, who knows what you did last night? But maybe it was studies, maybe it was with friends, but, but the pressure of this starts to start cooking here. And I just want to remind us, what is this all about? And so the first thesis is this, and there's nothing I'm going to say new here in some of these things, but the first thing is that the Christian life, it's really, it's all about being a lover. But it's about being a lover. It's about being a follower of the Lord. It's, and, and what is a follower of the Lord? It's a disciple of love. That's really all the things that you're learning, reading, everything. It's all about learning to be a lover. We think right with the, the great commandment here in Mark 12. Remember the scribe comes up and says to Jesus, what commandments the, 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 the foremost of it all? And he says, well, the foremost is this. Your Lord God is one, and that God you shall love with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Everything that you're trying to do, everything that you're trying to experience, it really, Jesus could boil it down to, it's about being a lover. It's about being a lover. And Paul says it in Galatians. You can just read with me as I'm going through these texts. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, to love your neighbor. This is all about love. It's about, it's about loving others, but then it's not just about loving others. You know what it's going to be? It's about being loved. So look at the next text, Jude 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Now, this is a command. Keep yourselves in the love of God waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's not just automatic that every day you're going to wake up. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if every morning you wake up and just, oh, love, God, I'm so loved by you. Oh, God. Keep yourself in the love of God. That's a command. See, we're, see, the Christian life is about loving others, but you know, part of the Christian life, in fact, I think it's a major part, is to continue to open yourself to the love of God daily. And wouldn't it be cool if that was just automatic? But there are unloving pieces in the heart. This is 
Also, 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. I love this text. May the Lord direct your heart into the love of God and the steadfastness of Christ. Every day, God, direct my heart in the love of God because you know what my heart does? I'm 55. And I, I've been now at this faith, you know, I don't know, from around 36 years. Just about the same amount of time I got married. My heart tends to go all over the place. Still, I'm a professor of spiritual theology and philosophy, and my heart still, it flies all over the universe. And, and, and no, God, I, I need to continue to direct my heart into your love. So the Christian life is about loving, it's about being loved. But notice the next text, this is the Great Commission. And the Great Commission, you know what this is going to be about? It's going to be about be giving yourself so much to this life of love so that you can go out and make other lovers of God. Remember the Great Commission, they came to him at the end and they worshiped, some were still doubtful, and then Jesus says, by the way, this is what, this is what we're about now. All authority has been given to me, and here's what I want you to do. And now in the Great Commission, just so you know, we're not going to talk about this much. The Great Commission has one command in it. There's only one imperative, and the imperative is this. Make disciples. The imperative is not go. That's actually in the Greek what we call a participle. And so the, the participles are going, baptizing, and teaching. But the command is to make disciples, to make followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so while we're going, while we're going wherever we're going, to Home Depot, to Biola, to a church, to another country, while we're doing this, here's what we're to do. We're to immerse or identify them in this trinity, baptize them. That means immersing in the life of the trinity, the new life that's come in you. And we're to teach people to observe everything that Jesus has commanded. The Great Commission is not about just saving souls. The Great Commission is about making disciples. It's making full disciples. It's about making lovers. I remember one mission professor said, well, Tom, what does the Great Commission have to do with spiritual formation? And it's the Great Commission is spiritual formation. The Great Commission is just going wherever you are and making people who will follow Jesus. It's not just about saving. And so here our Christian life is about loving, it's about being loved, and it's about becoming such great lovers that you are wherever you are, I don't care where you are, it's making other lovers of God. And that begins with conversion. But here's the second thesis, just as we're going on these notes. This is not just all going to happen on that. And so here's the second thesis. Uh, this, this actually, one of my friends, Dallas Willard, he's really impacted me about this over the years. I used to hate that word, training, spiritual discipline, but now I see what it's about. And here's what he says. The Christian life of discipleship and love. Now, think, you got to think about this. It's not about trying, but it's about training. You just got to think about this. The Christian life is not about trying, it's about training. According to Paul, the whole life is a training in love and godliness. Just the text that I put there, 1 Timothy 4, 7, he says, bodily discipline is some value, but discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Train yourself, right, from the idea of gymnastics, gymnasium. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. Or 1 Corinthians 9, I train my body, I make it my slave for the sake of ministry. 2 Timothy, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier. Right? You're, you're, you're an enlisted person now. He also uses that you're an athlete, you're like a hardworking farmer. This whole life, it's not going to be about trying, it's about training. So just kind of read me, I'll, I'll just read with me in the notes here. Uh, this is how Willard actually puts it. He says, you can take any command in the Bible, take any command, loving God, putting off jealousy, put off pride, life, love your wife, don't worry. And here's what he says. It's magical thinking that just by trying, you're going to be able to pull that off. 
I mean, wouldn't that be cool if every time you heard a sermon, and the sermon was today, I want you to put off all jealousy, and you could just say, Jealousy, be gone! And it's gone. Wouldn't that be cool? It's over. And Or you hear the command, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you just say, okay, <laughs> love! And now you're loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Willard is right. That is fantasy. Because there's all kinds of other pieces in our heart that are going to come up to betray us. All of a sudden, I just told the Lord, God, I'm going to be patient. I just heard a sermon about the patience of God and how we should be patient. And now I'm with my daughters and... I told the Lord I wasn't going to be angry. And now I'm getting angry at my wife. Willard says it's fantasy to think that we, by just willpower, by trying, are going to be able to keep these commands from the heart. And he says the second point, more we, we want to learn to do this from the inside out. We don't want to just learn not to get angry. You know what we want to become? A person who enjoys not getting angry. See, I don't want to just kind of love you. I want to become a person where I really want to love you. I take joy in loving you. I want transformation here. And so number three, here's this question. The real question you've got to ask is this. What, when I hear a command of God, love God, love your wife, put off anger, here's the question we ask. What kind of person must I become to live out that command from the heart? That's the question. Think of all the things. I remember as a Bible student, you're hearing the word of God left and right all day long. You're like being overwhelmed with this stuff. And the question is, you hear this is, God, what kind of, because I, I, I cannot just by trying keep all of these commands from the heart. Why? Because there's other stuff in my heart that's got to be put off all day. And so here's the real question. Lord, if I'm to become that kind of person, wow, who really does that, Lord, what, 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 is it gonna, what am I going to have to do? And this is the fourth question. What am I going to have to do? What am I going to have to train to become that kind of person? I'm not just going to pull off loving you like that. I'm not just going to pull off loving my wife like that. What kind of training do I need to give to my heart? And so I, I just put here, and you can just read with me. If you want to learn the computer, to be a mechanic, play baseball, pilot a plane, isn't it fascinating? You don't try. You train. You really got to think about that. Most of the skills that you've learned in life, like when I learned to finally uh, do the computer when I was in grad school, you know, this was, I don't know how long ago, it was quite a while ago. Uh, but when the computer, they were just cut. Now, some of you are thinking, well, all there, hasn't there always been a computer? No, there was a time when we had no computer. When I was in Iowa, I used to have a typewriter. Isn't that amazing? There were no computers. No personalized computers. But when I learned the computer, I didn't just go and try. Right when it first came out, Viola bought me one. I was getting my doctorate and, uh, at UC Irvine in philosophy, and I was teaching at Rosemead. They got me a computer, and I remember, uh, if, I, if I just, well, let me try the computer. That, that wouldn't work. I had to train. Or right now at ISF, one of our students is a pilot for FedEx. Well, it'd be kind of weird if I said, uh, you know, Mark, I want to try to fly your plane. Do you think Mark would want me to try to fly? <coughs> try to fly? No. He said, no, John, you're going to go train. You're going to train before you do this. Now, I used to be an athlete in high school. Now, that's way back. My, and I, used to, I told my daughter, my daughter uh, before I became a nerd, I was, I was like a super athlete. They go, no, Dad, you're, you weren't. No, I said, girls, really, I, I was built like a V. I was, they said, no, Dad, you, you, you're built like an A now. You're, you're built like a pear. But the truth was, I was a maniacal athlete in high school. I, I had personal trainers in football and in baseball. I, I remember engaging in training and lifting weights, running. I remember in playing baseball. 
I remember I trained so much in baseball. I would, I, I would be in batting cages forever. I got to a point in high school where I could see a 70 mile an hour pitch. That's pretty fast for high school. They get faster now. I see a 70 mile an hour pitch and I could see the threads on that ball. I could hit it all the time. It was amazing. Well, now I don't play baseball. And as you can tell, I don't do anything. <laughs> but if I got into a batting cage or with a pitcher pitching 70 or 80 miles an hour, oh my gosh. Yeah! I, I love going to batting cages with my daughters. My daughters are not athletes. And I love putting them in there. And here's when the pitch comes, because they're not trained in baseball. When they see a fast pitch coming, here's what they do. Yeah! Isn't it funny? that in most things in life we train. But in the most meaningful things in life, we don't. Romance, dating, marriage, parenting, relationships, your character, our spirituality. Often our attitude is, oh, I'll just try it. I'll try. I hear a sermon, I'll try. Yeah, God, I'll try that. God, I'll, I'll try to be good. God, I'll try to pray. I'll try to do this. And I'll just have to say, in marriage, now I've been married 36 years. Red and I both came to Bible. You don't love and stay in love by trying. You love and stay in love by trying. The soul has to be trained. You're not going to put off anger by trying. That anger is going to come out again. You put off anger by training. And it's the same with the love of God. We are not going to just always love God by trying. Because there are times when your love will be attached to everything else. And so the Christian life is about training. The third thesis is this, and I just do this quickly. The bottom of the page. This training is going to be an unusual training. This is not the typical training. When I, when I was being trained how to lift weights and how to do athletics, the coach would say to me, John, go lift this. And, and I get that. Okay, I'm going to go lift this. But this is a different training. Notice John 15, 5, Jesus says, apart from abiding in me, you can do nothing. You, you, you can't do this alone. The way Dallas Willard puts it, the Christian life is what you do when you finally realize you can't do anything in your own power. Or look on the, on the back side of the page. This is Ephesians 5.18. The, the command is don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's an unusual command. You know, it, those of you who know Greek, this is what we call the present passive imperative. It's a passive imperative. Most imperatives are active imperatives. Go lift weight. Go drink water. I understand those imperatives. But this is what we call a passive imperative. The command is that I am commanded to do something, but what is the doing? It's in the passive mood. I'm, a, I'm to allow the spirit to fill me. This becomes what most of us call a meta-command in the Christian life. I am to, in everything I do, whether it's being with my wife, studying, doing whatever I am to do, I can do it filled with the Spirit, meaning I have to do it open to another person. And so most commands are in the active mood, but this command is a receptive command. John, what you are to do, and this is what your life is. See, there's a training, but here's the training. The training is when you allow another person to impact you. So today as you're studying your exam, I want you just to think of the training. As you're studying for tests, as you're studying, you're reading your books or whatever you're doing, Here's part of your training that you can do. God, I don't want to do this alone. I don't want to do this in my own power. God, I, I want to invite you here. And I might not even know what I'm talking about here, but it says I'm to be filled with the Spirit. So, Lord, I just want you to say, I just want to let you know, while I'm studying, I want to open to you here. I want you to teach me. Why study alone in your own power? You could begin to practice inviting God each time into your studying experience. 
And so that last little bullet, the Christian life is not active. It's not you doing it all. You can't do it. But it's not passive. It's interactive. How can I live this interactive life? Well, here's the fourth thesis. What might this look like? What, what might it look like not to try, but to train? What would it might look like to take seriously the spiritual disciplines of how to stay in love? It is a train. I just want to give you three things to think about. Now, if I, if, I had, if, if I was your spiritual director, we would now enter into prayer together to discover in your life what is really needed. What do you need to work on? What do you need to look at? And so I'm just going to give you some ideas here, but I really encourage you, this might be a place where you really need another to help you. But there's three kinds of training I can think about. And here's the first one. And I'm just going to get these out and you can think about it. The first one is what I, I would call spiritual intentions. And then there will be spiritual rhythms and spiritual regimens. Here's a spiritual intention. And just read with this. It's the minimal spiritual discipline. This is a spiritual discipline. And you can practice this all the time. It's the minimal spiritual discipline where the will responds. It's a training. It's a discipline or a training of the will to respond to God. To say yes to God as an intention to be open to the Spirit of God in obedience, and then to go on and breathe. See, there's a time when you hear the Word of God, and, and, and here's, sometimes we have too much of a fantasy, and the fantasy is, yes, God, I'll do that, and I'll, I'll try as if I'm really going to keep that. No, you, you, want to, you want to clear away fantasy. Your yes to God does not mean you're going to keep and obey that command always, because you probably won't. You want to see reality. But you know how oftentimes, especially people who are, uh, I don't see a lot of old ones here, but as I know people who are getting older and they hear the word of God and they hear the word of God, you know how they walk away from sermons sometimes? They walk away thinking, yeah, I know I've heard that before. I know I've heard that before. I know I know about God. Okay. And they walk away frustrated. No, here, you know what you need to do? You need to train your will to respond to God, but reasonably. See, it, it's, it's a, again, it's fantasy to think that you can collect your will and say, yes to God, I will never disobey you on that. No, let's get clear what you're doing. When you hear the word of God, you hear the commands, here's what you can say. God, God, I have a spiritual intention. I wake in my will, and here's what I say. God, I say yes to you. Say yes to you. But God, tomorrow I may say no. Tomorrow I may act very unloving towards my wife. And so you know what I want you to do? I want you to teach me. See, you, you need to awaken your will in a reasonable way. These are spiritual intentions. God, yes. Yes, I open myself to you. And I, I invite you to teach me. Because when other pieces come out of my heart, you can teach me. What you don't want to do is be in a fantasy, but here's what you don't want to do. You don't want to start closing your will down in frustration and guilt. Because you've heard this before, and now you're frustrated. No, you want to do business with God. You want to accept his forgiveness each time and say, God, I bring myself again. This is Romans 12, to present your body. God, here I am. I come in my weakness, and God, I say yes to you. But I may be saying no 10 minutes from so I, let you, I, I give you permission to continue teaching. But here's the second thing you might do. These are what call spiritual rhythms. When students come to ISF, we try to help them to begin to really develop spiritual intentions of saying yes. We also help them with rhythms. And here's what a rhythm is. These are spiritual disciplines that assist you in developing rhythms of love. Rhythms of turning the heart to the love of God and neighbor. These are usually the classical disciplines. This would be like in the Bible, Psalm 5, where it says, in the morning I direct my, my prayer to you. Or Psalm 6, where I remember you on my bed. David began developing habits. Just reading in that bullet, these are rhythms for maintaining a relationship. See, right, there are times in your life where you need more than just intentions. You know, you need rhythms. 
some, you know, I remember going through Viola. There were times in my Viola experience where I maintained rhythms of love. Rhythms where I'd come and talk to God and be with Him. And then there were times where all of a sudden things got busy, the rhythms went out. It is just like a marriage. It's just like a marriage. There are times where Gwen and I are really in sync, we're keeping rhythms, and there are times where we're not. And so you, you might want to, see, you could right now, when you leave here, if you have a half hour today, you could just ask the Lord, Lord, I want to take what Coach said uh, serious. Are there some need of rhythms in my life right now? Rhythms of prayer. Rhythms of confessing sin. I have now a rhythm in my life where every morning I do certain kinds of prayer. These have become now rhythms. Every night, my wife and I do prayer each night. This has now been going on for some years. This becomes a rhythm of love. Or it might be number three. It's a little more serious. You need what is called a regimen. You know what this is? And I, I put this out for you just to kind of you see the landscape of this. This is an intense, concentrated intention that's, or training that's needed for a short period of time. This is when, usually we do regimens when I really need to learn something, I really need to train myself in learning the computer, or if I'm having a real problem in life. And so this is a time where we might say, you know, I'm really struggling with lust right now. I'm really struggling with anger. I'm really struggling with sadness. I'm really struggling with my parents. I'm really struggling with loneliness. That's a time when the Lord says, hmm, maybe we need a regimen. Maybe we need something a little more intense. Now, this is an awful lot to take in, to think about. But I wanted to put up the landscape. And let me just say, you know, at the Institute for Spiritual Formation, we have spiritual directors where you can, in certain classes, or just personally, you can come over to the Institute and get hooked up with a spiritual director. Now, I know that word hooked up is, is a weird word today, but, uh, but you, can, you can get connected to a spiritual director. That spiritual director's task is to kind of help you discover, where am I? Am, am, am I in fantasy? Am I not saying no to you? How can I begin to say yes to you? Are there rhythms in my life? Are there some regimens? I want to end with just this. This is a, a little prayer of intention. In the next three minutes, I want to teach you. This is, this is a kind of rhythm of intention. It's kind of bringing the first two together. You can actually do this. I call it the prayers of intention, ways to pray without ceasing. Let me just say to you, when I, for years, now this is for years, when I would wake up in the morning, I don't know what you do when you first open your eyes, but here's what I would do. My mind would kind of fly everywhere. And you know what I decided to do? My mind normally would go through its worries and concerns. And so you know what at some point I decided to do? I need to retrain those first moments when I wake up. Because Jesus says, well, your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So when I first wake up, my treasure is, I just would start flying to this. And so I began to pray, no, God, I want, I, I want to talk to you first. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. For the, just try this for two weeks. When you wake up, the first moments you wake up, take three minutes and do these four prayers. And I'll just run through them really quick in the next minute. Or two. The first one is I call this prayer presenting. And you know what it is? It's this the simple prayer where I present myself to God. I did it this morning. First thing I woke up, my mind immediately started thinking of this chapter. And I just said, no, first things first. God, and here's the prayer. I'm here. I present myself to you. I present myself to you, God. Before I present myself to speaking in chapter, forget it, Lord. I want to present myself to you. You know, that has become, in these last three years, such a joy in my life. To just each morning collect back my heart and say, God, I present it to you. And then I move right to the prayer of recollection. I think Todd has actually taught the, during one of these chapels. But the prayer of recollection is simply, this, is, is simply the prayer of this. God, whatever I do today, I want to do this open to you. At my core, Lord, I'm not someone who has to speak and please these students. You know what my core is? I'm in Christ. It, the prayer of recollection is it's, it's a discipline of reminding myself who I am. And then I move right to the prayer of honesty. So this morning, first thing I said, God, here I am. I present myself to you. And I'm not a speaker. 
That's not my, that's not who I am. You, you know, you're not a student. That's not who you are at the core. You don't have to please your professors. You don't have to get A's. That's not your core. You know what your core is? You're in Christ. So I want to remind, remind myself of that. And then I move right to the prayer of honesty. God, here's what's really on my heart. So I did that. And the last prayer is the prayer of discernment. I asked the Lord, and God, this is what's really on my heart. These are the anxieties and the worries I have today. But God, I want to know, what are you doing? I do that for about three minutes each day. I, this is something you can do. This is something you can retrain. Some of you need to retrain what you do when you first open your eyes. Because something else is going on. And here we have the opportunity to do this. So let me pray. Father, uh, just uh, as we collect some of these thoughts, we, I just ask you to teach the students what it would be not to just try in the Christian life, but what it would be to take seriously training. Training their souls in love. Training their souls regarding anger and lust. Some of these students need, uh, we, all, we all need one another. So some of these students would need help in this training. I pray they find that, whether it's a therapist at Rosemead, a Violet Counseling Center, a spiritual director, a friend, a faculty. Or maybe it just might be their own prayer life. They would ask you, God, what would it be to train? Especially in the morning, Lord. What would it be just to present ourselves to you? To, to remind ourselves who we are in Jesus' name. That's, that, that at the core, we're not students and professors. At the core, we're, we're now ones who are loved by you and learning how to love. And then to share just honestly what's in my heart, to really share honestly what's going on, to ask you to work. God, bless these students. I remember being here. And what an incredible time in my life it was. So watch over their hearts, bless them, and love them. Hear their prayers. In Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.